How's every, how many, how, y'all worn out? I can tell. I can just, I, you know, I can just tell. And I, I don't think it's just my, you know, I'm not just projecting. I know I'm exhausted, but I, I, I know it's you too. Um, you know, they told me this was the title, so I, I'm going to do what I want to do, but that's, 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 uh, they see, I sent her, I said, well, I could do this or that, and she says, well, yeah, whatever you do, it's going to be called the Sankofa moment, so, um, so, you know, you might know about the Sankofa bird, right? It's an African bird, it says, Sankofa is a word from, so, so it's from Ghanaian language, translates as reaching back to get it, and be reaching back into the past so that you can, what, move into the forward, right? So you think of San, what, Santana's, Santana's, right? Santana's, uh, you have to, if you don't know your past, you get to repeat it. So, and that's what I spent a lot of time doing, of course, looking at the past. And I, I have to remember now and then I'm supposed to move forward because I kind of love the past. Um, so that's where we're headed. And wait, hold a second. And this is going to be a very different pace because you're going to do a lot more work than you did when I was talking uh, yesterday. So and I thought to get our energy going, we would treat this a little bit like a worship service. So I thought we'd do opening words and then we're going to sing, okay? So let's do this together. I do not wish to breathe another breath if it is not shared with others. The breath of life is not mine alone. Brought myself to be with you, hoping that by inhaling the passion, the courage, the hope found here, I can exhale the fear, the selfishness, the separateness I keep so close to my skin. I cannot live another moment, at least not one of joy unless you and I find our oneness somewhere among each other, somewhere between the noise, somewhere within the silence of the next breath. Wow. And you all know this piece? Okay, well, let's sing it together once, and then let's see if we can handle a round, okay? Why don't you stand up? Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power. Spear. So do it again together, and then after the next time we'll split up, okay? Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, Gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in the mystery of the hour. So I should say that first reading, yes, Oop. that's all right. Um, this is Kristen Harper, our colleague, and you can find that if you go to the Meadville Lombard website and go to the Sankofa archive collection and go under worship resources, and that, that's there and a whole bunch of other materials as well. So what are we going to do? See, this is how I know what I'm going to do. Oh, nature of racism and how racism affects us. So we're going to, actually, we're going to look first at our own lives. That's what we're going to do. So you're going to have to do some work, and you're actually going to have to sit closer together. Um, so what, what, I, 
what I want to start with is for you to provide the content for yourselves. So what I want, let's see, did I put it? Oh, there it is. What is your earliest memory of becoming aware of race? So this is what I want you to do. I want you to pair up with someone and you both, you're gonna talk for two minutes. One person's gonna talk about their earliest memory. I'll tell you when two minutes is over. The other person will talk for two minutes. Then you're gonna find another two people and the one person will report on the other person's experience in one minute and the other person will report on the other's experience. And all four of you will do that. You'll keep that to four minutes. They'll tell you when three minutes has passed and then you'll have a little brief discussion about whether there's any themes. You got it, are you with me? Am I, was that clear? Okay, no, it was not clear. Okay, so the, that's what you're gonna talk about. Yes, we're, you, got, you got that, okay. Then you're gonna find a person, you're gonna sit with somebody, and, you're gonna, and the other person's gonna look at you delightedly, no matter what you say. Okay, completely affirming, 100% affirming your inherent worth and dignity and you're gonna tell your story for two minutes. What is your first memory? And then I'll say, switch. And when I say switch, the other person will talk about their earliest memory or memories for two minutes. And then I'll say, find two other people. Then you're gonna find two other people and the person that you heard the story from, you'll repeat that story to the group of four. Okay, you with me? and you get a minute each to do that. That's four minutes, and then one last minute to see if any themes bubbled up. Okay, and then we'll report back on those. So find somebody, I'll give you, briefly let you do that. Okay, um, if you, everybody's got somebody, you're gonna start right now. Time to switch to the other person.
Okay, find another pair to speak to. Yeah, we're fine. I mean, switch. Did you, yeah, go ahead. Oh, your time, you get four minutes, one minute each. Then then I said, what? So one more minute, and then you're going to see if you have any themes that came up. Oh, you should 
begin talking about whether any themes emerged when in the, out of the stories. I'll give you a minute to do that. Okay, time. Get us, you know, okay, turn around back this way. So I always, you know, I'm always tempted to just let you talk because I, I know you, I could do it and completely get away with it and you would never even know. You'd say, oh, what a good workshop, right? And I, you know, and. So, would anybody like to speak to a theme that emerged? But we should use the mic because the room is big, and you—I don't think—I think it swallows up sound pretty quickly. So, if yeah, if a couple of people would speak. It just occurred to me, even after we finished talking, that we were all fine until somebody else told us that these people were not uh, friends or worthy or whatever. And it was the message we got from other people, not ourselves as children. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. This may reinforce that. Uh, we all felt that we started from place where we were when we first became aware and for at least three out of the four of us, that place where we started was pretty much lily white. Thank you. Well, as the song says, all of us as children were surprised that it was a difference that made a difference. Yeah, yeah. Similarly, in our group of four, um, there was a certain innocence, but for all of us, things really happened when we were children. It wasn't, you know, going away and being in a totally different environment. All of us, again, found out from other people, not from our families, but from other people, that there were differences and, you know, there were certain lines you didn't cross. Thank you. Hi. So our group thought we didn't have any uh, similarities running through, but then as you asked the question, uh, with the exception of me, the, the realization of race came later in life. So for me, I just talk about it being kind of since I was born, right. but I think with the rest of the people in the group, it was once there was exposure to other that it came. Right, right. For our group, uh, all four of us, there was, it was about a first encounter with a racial group or the potentially having contact with a, a different racial group. And there was also fear associated with each of our stories. Thank you. Okay, let's, okay, this is last. For, Two. Okay. For our group, it was um, a, a kind of a mutual experience of confusion. Right. Um, a couple of us had families that were um, pro-racial integration 
um, and then were confused when the rest of the world wasn't um, that way or the arrival of African-American children in an all-white school and how those people needed to be welcomed. Um, the difference between the lives of um, the family and the lives of the housekeeper um, who lived in the poor black section. Thank you, Linda. For our group, uh, the, the, con the awareness was important, but it was how we became aware, which was through our parents. Each of us had a story that had to do with how our parents handled something, ranging from scout troops being blended uh, by race, one partnering with another, or one uh, having a parent spank them with the use of nigger, when that was the only spanking that they ever received. Wow, wow. Thank you. Are you you're gonna sit down, right? Or are you gonna say, say something, Bill? <laughs> Bill's gonna say something. Go ahead. When I was six years old, I went to my father's hardware store in downtown, and he was he and his clerks were serving everyone equally. Black, white, Oriental, Indian, Metis. This was in Winnipeg, Canada. Right. And so I, I grew up feeling we were all part of the human race. So you knew there were differences, but it was still, they were inconsequential. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It was a shock to come to the United States, <laughs> especially the t South. Thank you. So, pretty, yeah, typical, interesting. We got these themes all right. It's pretty typical stories. Like, I mean, with you, I don't remember not knowing. I mean, so I think if you're a person of color, you don't remember not knowing. It's just, you know. Um, and you know, so early there is, there's no, there was no moment. Um, and, my experience at Meadville, because this is one of the, the, one of the issues I, I wrote, start my class with, is that and many Euro-Americans don't think of it, for some for a long time, they're, they're, they live in so much inside a Euro-American bubble that the issue just doesn't arise. And then sometimes it's family. I mean, you raise the issues. I mean, it's kind of so. I'm gonna, uh, let's see what, where I'm gonna go with this now. Because all, all you're gonna do is echo things you've already said. Ah, our fundamental nature. No one is born a racist. What we need is to be held, fed, and feel the world is absolutely delighted with you. That's, that's all Ferdinand, that's Ferdinand there. He's, he's five months old. Uh, that's all Ferdinand needed, right? And, um, and is, I've known his mother since she was, what, 16. And, um, he, uh, I went, I met Ferdinand for the first time in December, but and we got, you know, we got, I would put him on my chest and she would, so I was there so she could take a break and she'd go out and we'd just cuddle up together and he'd go to sleep. And um, it, whatever these things are, I mean, no one's born a racist. That's the whole, we know that, right? I mean, that's not, that's a given. Children are naturally curious about everything. Difference only momentarily frightens them. They will adjust if there's no danger and their fear is not reinforced, right? That's, uh, so these are the things I've figured out. That's, so that's um, Sophie, is the, is the little girl on the, on the right. Your right, is that? Left, and um, on your right. And that's her grandmother, Brigitte, Brigitte. So I've known her grandmother since 72. Actually, I knew, I knew Sufi, Sophie's mother when she was that age, uh, Bettina. And just a little, so Bettina, at that age, Bettina moved with them, they moved to Bangkok. That's where she grew up in Bangkok. And then later, uh, Sophie was born in Namibia. That's where um, they were. So again, that's, if that's what Sophie grows up with, that's, you know, people of color and difference is not, doesn't phase Sophie because that's, and her, I know her parents or grandparents don't communicate any anxiety about that to her. 
Um, so that's how, again, it, it's, it's not in your inherent nature, right? Your inherent nature is to be interested in difference and to go toward things. And if something happens, what do you do? You run, grab mommy or daddy's leg and go blah, 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 for a while. And then that gets boring pretty quickly. And then they venture back out. I mean, y'all know this. Y'all did it and you all have seen it. That's what they do. Children are naturally emotionally attuned to fairness and protest the first time they see prejudice acted out. Now, actually, I've got something here. I wanna, I wanna, where is it? Let me get my glasses. I'm, this is, these are not quite kids, but um, it's from Southern Witness. This is just my, I'm pitching uh, for Gordon here, <laughs> for those who haven't seen the book yet. Um, so this is about Unitarians in the South. And he just has, this is about Wade and Becky Till. And they're older, but it's, it's enlightening. Becky Till, who he's writing about, they're members in Tennessee and Knoxville. Becky Till grew up in Africa, where her parents were part of the, the United Presbyterian Mission. Her childhood playmates were African. Living in Africa and living in Knoxville as an adult, she joined the Cedar Springs Presbyterian Church. She recalls that a very nice, well-educated, middle-class, middle-aged black businessman lived in the area and came and asked to join. When he was turned down, she left the church and never returned. That's how she ended up a Unitarian. Um, Way Till, her husband, grew up in Mississippi. He recalls noticing and reacting against the mistreatment of blacks. When I was in high school, I was beginning to get pissed off about this, these things that were going on. Hell, I was raised with blacks. I knew they were people. I went in the service and wound up playing football and working with blacks in the Air Force. We played football together and lived together and worked together. I just didn't go back to Mississippi, he says. So the, I, I think kids, are, well, I know kids are, I was, I assume you all were a Wear of fairness, boy. If my brother got a crumb more uh, <laughs> cake than me, you know, I was. Uh, I mean, kids are kind of concrete, you know, and they kind of know what's fair and that's not fair. You're not treating this people person the way you treat that person. I think, and that's something built into the nature. Kids think fairness. This should be for this way for me and for you too. So I think kids are distressed the first time they see fair of uh, prejudice act out, and probably sexism too. So, but if a child knows nothing else, it will come to accept racism as normal, okay? Given our inherent na nature is not to be that way, but if you see nothing else, that it looks, begins to, over time, look quite normal to you. Prejudice is learned. That's, prejudice is something that must be systematically taught and culturally reinforced. I don't think it can probably exist without that that has to be taught to children, that children on their own wouldn't do that. But that's, so you were saying that, right? That it didn't come from in, it didn't come from in here. I didn't say in here, anybody said that. I, I heard they say it came from outside, whether from those surround, your parents or others, but it wasn't inherent in, in you. And I don't think it's inherent in you, and that's why it has to be, and that's why it has to be literally culturally imposed so, I mean, the message behind this course is nobody, you're not to blame. People really ultimately aren't to blame, no matter on, on this. So it's a parent's response to a child's openness, abandoned curiosity, and then reflects a parent's fears, both real and fictitious. Are you with me? So it's what the kids end up regulating off of, because what well, kids are out there, right? They, you know, I mean, they, everything in the mouth and, you know, whatever it is, they, they want it all. That's my experience. Kids are endlessly curious. They want it all. They want to engage in everything. And, and they don't know, they don't really respect limits. They don't like limits. They don't appreciate limits. Well, you know, because we have to childhood, what are we talking about? We childproof the house, right? <laughs> That's, uh, you know, and we pretend it's for their good, but it's, you know, it's more often for us. Um, and so the kids out there, so that's not what they pick up then. And who's saying it's they pick up on their parents' anxieties and, and fears. And some are real and should be real. You know, you don't, kid doesn't walk out in the street. And many are completely fictitious, they have nothing to do with reality except the emotional reality the parent carries within. 
So a parent's response to a child's moral protest, so this, this is when the child says, no, it's not fair, right? Well, the parent then says, ranging from violence to hushing, shaming, scolding, to withdrawal of affection. So the UUs probably, you know, kind of range on the scold, the shaming kind of thing. I, that's my, I, my mother would never hit me, but she, all she had to do, she had the look. <laughs> Your mother had the look? Yeah, my, my mother I had the look, and I knew. I knew right then that, uh-oh, better stop doing whatever I was doing. She never had to, she never had to hit me. Um, so I, th I think that's, but, kind of, but it doesn't happen once, you know? You understand this doesn't happen, this happens, it happens, it happens, not, not even a hundred times. It happens a thousand, it happens 10,000 times. That's, I think kids are pretty resistant, but against that kind, I mean, it's, it's probably ceaseless. They pick up on a parent's anxieties. And, and the kid will be, complaining. you know, you have someone with, you know, purple hair. If a kid sees a guy with a purple mohawk, what are they gonna do? They're gonna go, ooh, look, he's got a purple mohawk. Well, the parent not about, yeah, but if you know, someone of color, they said, oh, he's got brown skin. Then the parent, even without saying anything, when they, they hear the breath go, because <gasps> the parent doesn't, is embarrassed, the kid knows just like that, just like that. So kid learns, kid learns, you know, we pick up. The child faces a dilemma. Why, because well, the kid at some levels gets confused and no, it doesn't make sense, but he idealizes the parents as well as needing and feeling they belong in a group. So they, I mean, these are basic needs for the parent, right? You have, they can't survive without the parent and they really can't survive without the group. So even though this stuff is getting laid on them, even though they know at some intuitive level that it doesn't make sense, their survival depends on their parents and on the group. So they have to come around, somehow come to terms with that. So a child experiences moral confusion. Someone talked about that. One of you mentioned that, right? Moral confusion and emotional pain when faced with this dilemma. What do I, I'm having this experience, it doesn't make sense. I don't like it, I don't think it's fair. But if I say anything, mom and dad's not gonna be happy. You know, I'm, I'm gonna get hushed or slapped at worse, so they, they're trapped at this point. And where do you go with the, I mean, I can remember having things I've wanted to talk, even about race, wanting to, but knowing that the conversation probably wasn't gonna be welcomed. And, and so you just don't go, I remember my first major confusion over. So my first major confusion actually was, um, mother was quite fair skinned as was her father, he, and, but it didn't have to do with them. It actually had, there was a boy down this block, his name was Eugene Payton, and he looked, I thought he was Italian or something. I, I mean, you know, he was, and he had that kind of look. And, and then I went down one day to play with him, and there was this older African-American woman on the porch, and I went in, and I, boy, how the prejudice stuff worked, I assumed, I thought, I immediately thought, housekeeper. Boy, that's my classism. That's my classism. I completely own it. And I went back and said, hey, Gene, can we play? He said, no, my grandmother's here. And the penny dropped. I must have been about seven or eight. Penny dropped. That was his grandmother. And he was black. Looked white. And I remember going home and looking in the mirror and looking at mother and, and, and actually feeling unfair because I'd already picked up at seven or eight that it wasn't good to be black. Um, even though mother protested otherwise, I knew differently. Because, uh, oh, society, I mean, why they had all that bleaching cream in Jet Magazine? Well, that hair straightener in Jet Magazine, you know, I mean, it was not hard to pick up. The, the, was, and I remember, want, but I knew if I went to mother, I, this was not going to be a welcome conversation. So we didn't, I didn't, I just kind of left, felt with that confusion on my own. I can, God, talking about it, I can kind of feel it in my stomach. So in response to the dilemma, the child may remain silent, which is what I did, and sacrifice their sense of justice and fair play, and accept the confusion, join in in order to win back approval, right? I, we, we do that. 
um, narrow their lives to avoid the repeat of the situation and the unbearable sense of shame they carry. So you just, if you don't go certain places, don't do certain things, then you, you're not, then you, you can protect yourself by your little, your little bubble. Um, become fearful of difference. I mean, I think there's a limited number of kind of ways kids would deal with that. And those, I think, some of the ways. Miseducation, so this is big. Falsehoods, distortions, omissions, reinforce the sense of confusion, further promote isolation. So, uh, well, there's just a lot of falsehoods out there, right? Distortions, omissions, a lot of huge omissions. I mean, what was I talking about yesterday? I mean, I talked about the GI Bill. I mean, that, none of that appears in the history. Um, you know about sundown towns? Everybody knows about sundown towns, more or less? Well, if, you, if, you, if you're a person of color, you gotta be out of town. Southern, they had them in Ontario too. They got them in Ontario too. Um, down Le Leamington. Leamington was a sundown town. Um, if you were a person of color, if you're a Native American, you had to be out of town by sundown. Tens of thousands of towns, and not in the South. Not in the South. Um, but you don't, they don't tell you that history. I mean, there's all kinds of history stuff that people just don't learn. And therefore, since they don't learn the history, they get real confused because they can't figure out what's going on or why it's going on at all. I mean, it's, it's what's wrong with you people? Well, because the table was never even. It was never flat. And then there's all kinds of distortions. And, and um, just, I don't need to go on about that. You know what I'm talking about, right? OK. Um, whoop, what do I got here? Oh, what does that say? Oh, okay. wow. White privilege. Yeah, white privilege. That's the way white privilege works, gang, right? You can, huh? That's the way white privilege. You barely, you barely know what's happening, right? The, uh, we didn't even have the language. You know, we didn't even know how to talk about it until what Peggy Mac McIntosh um, wrote. What's it? Wrote, um, I've got it. White, white privilege unpacking the invisible knapsack. You know what year that was? 88, 1988. So not until 88, it's what, 25 years ago, we didn't even have language to talk about that. We didn't know how to approach what white privilege meant. And that's just, and she just introduced the concept, though. I have to say in, in um, the um, Selma Awakening, in the, in the, in the book, um, already in median 65, someone in a talk, began talking about privilege in, in a meeting after Selma. And it kind of was like this blip, but someone who had this vague awareness that there was something going on and used that word to describe it. Um, but it was clear people didn't, they didn't, I don't think really picked up on it. So what do we, oh, there we go. So white privilege. Um, white privilege means you don't know what DWB means. Do y'all know what DWB means? Okay, how many know what DWB means? Okay, most of you do. Now, okay, okay. Tell them what DWB means, gang. Okay, thank you. Good, God. Did y'all, well, you Unitarians, right? Like William Barber says, you Unitarians, right? Did you notice he got, he knew it was Parker who said that and not Martin Luther King? Did you pick that up? Well, he did his homework, actually. Clerks don't follow you around the store. You can take pride in your heritage and believe in your behavior and mores are normal. Okay, that you mean you're, so yeah. So that's what actually, yeah, I, I'm gonna say, yeah. It's interesting, you're not even, sometimes you're not even aware of your heritage. You just assume your heritage is normative, period, and everything else is other. You don't feel that you represent your race and must be a credit to it. Do y'all have to do that? No. Okay, so I, my mother is, my mother is right here. I, my mother, I couldn't go out with her without her reminding me that I was a black person. And I, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Right? And you gotta look right, you gotta act right, you gotta, you gotta, and you gotta act better. You gotta act better. I mean, and this was unreal. I couldn't get out of the house without that conversation. Couldn't get out of the house without that conversation with mother. Um, and what a burden, what a burden. Um, people don't assume you got your job through affirmative action. Um, huh? It's true for women too. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of parallels. 
there's a lot of parallels. I'm, and remind me if I jump over them, but I know there's a lot of parallels. And you don't have to educate your children about the black code in order to keep them safe. You all know about the black code? Oh, good God, this. We're easy. Yeah, you are easy. <laughs> Let me. Can you talk oh. about the black code? We gotta talk about the black code. Let's talk about black code. What's the black male code? So, okay, so, oh, I was gonna hear. I've got something I wanna read before we go into that. Um, so, after Trevon Martin, here, okay. Um, in the month, okay, the black code, a month after uh, Trevon Martin was, Jesse Washington wrote an article. Have most of you seen that article? Some, how, many, how many of you seen the article? Okay, Denny's seen it. Okay, um, it's entitled, Trevon Martin, My Son and the Male Black Code. He, it begins, I thought my son would be much older before I had to tell him about the male black code. He's only 12, still sleeping with stuffed animals, still afraid of the dark, but after Trevon Martin's tragedy, I needed to explain to my child that soon people might be afraid of him. So this is, these are some excerpts from what appeared in that article. Always play close attention to your surrounding son, especially if you are in an affluent neighborhood where black folks are, where black folks are few. Understand that even though you are not a criminal, some people might assume you are, especially if you are wearing certain clothes. Never argue with police, but protect your dignity and take pride in humility. When confronted by someone with a badge or a gun, do not flee, fight, or put your hands anywhere other than up. People, don't, please don't assume, son, that all white people view you as a threat. America is better than that. Suspicion and bitterness can imprison you but as a black male, you must go above and beyond to show, show stronger than a stranger what type of people you person you really are. So I've got I got a couple of stories. So it's, um, I was in I go to Tubbs in Tulsa, um, preaching at All Souls, very upscale neighborhood. The art museum in town is just down just around the corner, and big monster houses. And I went out for a walk. And I had my dreads at that point. <laughs> and I had to emotionally prepare myself and think about that it's quite possible that I'm gonna run into a police officer and I have to, I kinda coach myself beforehand. I mean, that's, you know, this, that's, this has been the last six years. That's routine for me. So why is it routine? So I'm, um, in this is in Toronto. I'm in Toronto. I had a support group I was in. It was at a Unitarian's home. And um, it, it was upscale um, neighborhood on the west side. And I um, got there early, a little early. Nobody was there. In any case, nobody was there. And I was in jeans, had my dreads again. And I'm sitting there waiting. And I'm waiting and waiting and nobody shows up. And then a cop car goes by. Well, yeah, big deal. Until when by the second time. And I said, oh, fuck. <laughs> and then he went by a third time. And he stopped. And I have to brace myself. You know, I have to get ready. And he comes up and I say, yes, officer, can I help you? I mean, I'm, you know, I, you know, I put the whole minister, th I'm not dressed like a minister, but I, and I know as soon as he hears me, looks in my eyes, he knows, he knew instantly he needed to extract himself from this situation, but he has to go through with it. And I'm sure some neighbor called, I'm sure some neighbor called. So we go, th I said, well, yes, officer, I'm here. I come here every Sunday for Baba and Dada. And then he said, well, I have to have your ID. And so he takes my ID and he goes, checks, types in the thing. By the time he gets back, the people have arrived, and they're largely white women, and they are pissed. <laughs> they are really, really pissed, and they let into him. And I couldn't do that, Kang. I couldn't, I knew I couldn't do that, right? 
to, to escalate it, I had to keep it under control. They, they escalated, because they wanted to do shit to them. But if I escalated it, we, you know, a huge risk. So I, but I carry that all the time. That's white privilege doesn't, don't, you know, that's, that's what white privilege is. You don't carry that with you every minute. And I know 99% of the time, nothing's gonna happen, but I, I don't have a switch. I mean, I've got some mindfulness. I know when it turns on. My, my buddy, I don't know Skip Gates. Skip Gates forgot that day uh, and ended up in the White House uh, having beer with Officer Crawley. Um, but I'm like, you know, I'm like, Skip, well, you know, what are you thinking about, man? You know, you, you know, he knows better. Colin Powell says he knows better. Colin Powell said, well, my mother taught me. Did you, I don't even remember that. Colin Powell said, you know, right? You, Colin Powell said, my mother told me how to behave. You don't front on a police officer. I, yeah, but I don't care where you, no, 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 it doesn't matter. But he forgot, he forgot. It's, that's what's, I think, hard for folks to realize that you just, you know, we, that's inculcated. We know you can't do that because I know who's got the gun. I know who's got the power. I know how to, I can read the badge number. I mean, I, I can memorize the name, but I'm not gonna front on an officer. Are you out of your mind? Well, he was, I don't know, he was tired and sick and you know, the rest is history. Let's see, where, what I got next? So, because African Americans and Euro Americans everyday experience vary so much from one another, what happens? Whites, since it isn't a problem for them, don't see it as a problem and they don't even talk about it because it's not a problem. What, what's to talk about? Works for me. It sure does, kind of. Whites are ignorant and confused about race. Yeah, either they don't know nothing or they got the wrong information or they get confused because they don't understand it because then, again, they can't match their experience with it. I mean, their experience is one, right? It doesn't. So blacks, though, frequently experience micro, we're gonna talk about microaggression in a moment. So micro, which is going on all the time, and blacks have a tendency to see everything problem as an issue of race. So I should, so, I mean, how often, you know, how often do we think of race? Every day? How many times a day? All the time. <laughs> you too? All day, every day. All day, every day, okay. You too? You don't, you don't think about race? <laughs> okay. Okay, how, how often do y'all think of race? And you do too. How about how do y'all think of race? Once a week? Once, once a day? No, you're married to a black man. <laughs> you do, okay. Okay. I mean, if you got a reason to, right? But otherwise, again, that's where you get to kind of, what, is it a problem? Oh, ooh. If you're black, it's just, and they, we're, it's, and they think we're racializing everything, so it looks like we're the problem because it looks like we're racializing everything, but the fact is the world is racialized and we experience it and white folks don't. That's so, but the, you see how the difficulty of communicating then, because the, you got these two fundamentally different experiences that, and then we don't talk, because lots of folks live in isolation and even if you know one another, we're often not comfortable enough to have the conversations where you might discover what it's like. So people have, with hang with yeah, married black folks or hang with black folks, they actually know. They actually know because they've been in there deeply enough. Um, what's that? Oh, ergo, whites feel blacks are, oh, it says exaggerating. Right, that's what I'm saying. They feel exaggerating. You make a big deal out of something that should be no deal because actually aren't we all equal? We, we, we know we're all equal. We're, we're equal. Aren't you equal? Now, yeah, they tell us um, this is America, right? Uh, so what do we got next? Whoop! The new face of racism, okay. Microaggression. Microaggression is a form of unintended discrimination it is depicted by the use of known social norms of behavior or expressions that while without conscious choice of the user, and has the same effect as conscious, unattended discrimination. Anybody want to speak to what microaggression looks like? You want to talk to it? Anybody get examples? I mean, I got, yeah, go ahead. Someone, go, someone speak, go up, go to talk about microaggression. 
Huh? We gotta go to Mike so people can hear. Chip. So a good friend, person of color, walks toward the elevator and the white lady there moves her purse to the other side and clutches it tightly. Right, right. And they've, and they've done studies like that. Come on up if you guys. They've done studies like where, that, where people have attested one thing and then they film them and they do exactly that. They move the purse to the other side, even though they've said something differently right before that. I mean, they set these, they set these things up. Go ahead. So in working in the corporate world, having someone tell me after knowing me for a couple of weeks, wow, I didn't realize you were so smart. <laughs> oh, the one that always gets me is that, well, everybody knows. So you know, if the address is somewhat there, it's going to be at the club. What club? So, you know, the everybody but you. Like, I didn't grow up with you. Thank you. Woman enters, white woman enters elevator. Black male enters elevator. Woman leaves elevator. Right. Across the street, as the case may be. Yes. I'm going to go through these real quick. So my hair is straight right now, but usually it's curly in its natural state. So can I touch your hair? Mm. Mm. Uh, I just got it. It probably wasn't intentional, but oh, you said that so articulately. Or you get a B on your paper because you couldn't have possibly wrote that. Mm. I'm, a, I'm not going to keep going. Okay. Mm. okay. <laughs> that, that's just a sample, huh? Yeah. Where to begin? My husband went to Oxford. He doesn't sound black. He's handed the keys when he's waiting for his car and asked to get other people's cars at restaurants. My daughter, who's mocha colored when she's two, I speak Spanish to her and only speak Spanish to her. And someone said to me, where's she from? And I said, she's from me. And she said, no, she's not. Yep. They then asked me how much she costs. Where did yep. I get her yep. from? Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, so it's continual. When Dave and I are together, everyone says good morning to him because they're proving they're not racist. Well, I walk around, they don't say good morning to me. So it's a microaggression uh, world. Yeah, right. But, and, but you imagine this, all these little, all the time. Right. Yeah, yeah. Every day, a new adventure. I think when whites consistently use terms like dark, black, etc., refer to something as referred to negative or evil or not positive or threatening. Right. Right. Happens all the time. Right. Oh, God, you guys remind me so many things. So on that one, um, if you've been in the storm so long, I know I'm selling my books, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> there's a great thing, um, dark and black and white, dark, dark and light, light and dark by Jackie James that addresses exactly that, that, that issue. And if I had it, I'd read it to you because what it shows is how deep this stuff is because our language is loaded. Jackie went through the entire hymnal and could not one find one affirmative mention. This is the old hymnal, sorry. Um, Hymns for the Celebration of Life, the, the, the blue one. Could not find one affirmative mention of black or dark. She found dozens of negative, um, negative references to black and darkness. Not, that one, that's what we went through, putting the new hymnal together just to balance the language. But that, so what does that do to your consciousness? What does that do to your consciousness? One, you need, if I, that's another workshop I do. You know, there's not one reading, there's not one gospel, there's not one spiritual in that old hymnal, one they did in, right after merger in 62, 63. Nothing about black culture. You got Gandhi in there, you got Kabir in there, you got Lao Tse in there. You got nothing by an African American. Not one word, not one, not one reading, not one hymn. But what happens, huh? That's not in there. No, no, it's not in there. It's in, you know, the place that first appeared in New Youth Hit the Tough is in uh, the one they did in Los Angeles, How Can We Keep From Singing? That's where it first appears. There's not, but you see, that works on consciousness. When that's the language, it just reinforces this other stuff floating out. In, in society and just reinforces, just holds it in place and by its associations, negative associations with uh, black and darkness. The other place we've got a sermon, Jackie delivered a sermon at the UUA chapel 
and that's in Darkening the Doorways, the entire sermon where she discusses it, and it's titled, Is There No Beauty in Darkness? Um, I have a little more. I, gotta, uh, I, I, I was talking about this stuff in Cleveland, and uh, uh, Unita- a woman uh, who's been a long time Unitarian sent this note to me. Uh, my experience there as a long time member is that members are still asking me, me, oh, so where do you live? And mistaking me for one of the other or the few women of color in the congregation. And that, and that actually, so that reminded me of, uh, she wrote me this, and that reminded me I had a conversation with a man in, in Reading who was furious because everybody kept mistaking him for this other man. He pointed at the other man across the room. He, they didn't look n- n- nothing alike, gang. I mean, nothing. Um, and then, and in Toronto, oh, here we go, you know, so uh, there were, there was a Gloria, sorry, Elizabeth lived and was a member of Toronto first. Gloria was a member in Ottawa. And every time we had national meetings, people couldn't keep Elizabeth and Gloria c- clear. And they would keep, and so whenever I'd see Gloria, I'd say, oh, hi, Elizabeth. And every time I see that, you know, this is how we deal with microaggression. We make fun of it because we all we knew what we we know what we we're doing. I'd see Elizabeth. I'd say, "Oh, hi, Gloria." I'd say, Liz, "Gloria." I say, "Hey, Elizabeth," and then we have our laugh, and then we go on because it was bound to happen. So that's the, oh, another microaggression happens, and, and this real unconscious. I can go on. Um, how do African Americans dress when they go to church, gang? Oh, yeah, y'all. You probably noticed if you if you went to church with us on. Uh, Thursday night. I mean, I mean African Americans' tradition is to dress up, right? You dress up. I mean, you have to think about it. these are you know, probably largely working class people, um, you know, they, or you wear uniforms. And what do you want to do? How do you want to present yourself to your community and your God on Sunday? What do you want to do? You want to dress up. How do we dress? We dress down. Now, we're not bad people because of that, because most of we have white collar jobs, right? And how do we bring our authentic self? You, you, dress, you dress casual, not cause, just because you want to be you. You don't want to be in your business uniform. But what happens when an African American walks in that door and sees all these Priuses in the parking lot and, uh, and, 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 um, and people dressed down? Like, well, before they get in, they already know, actually, if they scan the parking lot. But as soon as they, from the, that door, they all of a sudden, the, the emotional feeling is, oops. Oops. Um, and we're not even, we don't, and since you're in the box, we're in the box, we don't even think about it. We don't even go far enough to think, hmm, maybe we ought to ask our greeters and our ushers to dress up. You know, maybe not everybody else, but maybe that's part of the job description, that if you're a greeter or an usher, you just dress a little more nicely, because there may be somebody, and probably this is true with working class and other people too, who are gonna come to church a little dressed and um, it, it might ease their way in. But again, when you're inside the box, you don't do that and you don't, you don't experience this microaggression. But when there's, I don't mean, it doesn't even, you know, when these little microaggressions are coming all the time, it kind of wears you down and you try to keep yourself out of those situations. So we get confused why white, black folks don't show up. Well, it's either us have, have so used to it, we don't even notice it anymore, um, or the folks disappear. Okay, let's see, what I got there? Ah, oh, liberals, yeah, liberals. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm shifting gear here a little bit. So, because we want to do right. I, there's no question we want to do right. An attempt to bolster, how am I doing? Okay, an attempt to bolster our ego. How much time do I have? Boy, am I? Oh, I can go on forever, but I, 4.15? Oh. It was two hours. Oh, no, shit. Oh, God, you know, hang, oh, God, it's how stereotype. Ah, oh, it's very typical. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to drop one piece of what I was going to do, but I'm, we'll keep going here. In an attempt to bolster our egos, we often find our values in others' actions rather than, in value in our actions rather than our inherent worth. What's our, what's the, our inherent worth and in dignity and goodness, worth and goodness? I am good because why? I do good rather than I am inherently good. It's a form of neo-Puritanism. So we, we pretend... We pretended that we gave up, that we no longer Puritans, but it's bullshit. Um, it's, uh, 
You know, I mean, you know, I know how you read. We grow. The first principle. What's the first principle, gang? The worth and dignity of every person, right? And then we go dot dot dot, and y'all filled that in. You know, you, think, you if I'm a good, if I'm an activist, I'm good. If I do this, I'm good. Y'all got. There's all kinds of qualifiers on there, but you look, there's no qualifiers on there. The only qualifiers on there in here. That's where the qualifiers, and I know, you, I know we've got them. So part of our uh, activism is connected with doing good. It's tricky, it's a bit dangerous. Um, I'll, come, I'll come back, because, okay, well, I'm gonna start with that. I'll come back to that, and I'm gonna say it. So the trouble is the activism is attached to what then? Guilt and self, right? It's not, it's not attached to the person or the cause. Or, you know, it's attached to you feeling good about yourself while you're pretending that you're doing it for the other person. That's the problem with do-goodism. Are you with me on that? That's the problem. And it's the sleight of hand that we do to ourselves. I mean, it's this kind of thing we do to ourselves. We fool ourselves. I'm, activist and therefore I'm good. No, you're good whether you're an activist or not. Okay, you're good whether you're an activist or not. You're good whether you're a baby, you're good whether you're 90. It does not have nothing to do with inherent worth and dignity. Nothing at all. But we attach, especially us in midlife who think we need to outdo this stuff, we attach our actions to our goodness. And that's why we're still Puritans and in denial. Ooh. Guilt. Mm. You can see there, there's up there. Okay, you know, you all know Bill, right? <laughs> Bill Schultz wrote, guilt deals cruelly with vision. Guilt may initiate action, but we cannot sustain the work if we are, remain mired in feelings of shame. Eventually, we'll either distance ourselves from the ego-corroding acid of shame or become addicted to the moonshine of feeling holier than thou. Okay. So it's got, it's got ill guilt doesn't go very far. Actually, Barber, um, Reverend Barber, when he was up here, I, I, did, I did a turn on this, I think. He, he phrased it, I think, affirmatively rather than the negative. He talked about the restoration of imagination. I think that's what he mentioned, this restoration. So that's the, the flip end of this. He, he says, cruelly with vision, that is, you don't have vision that comes out of guilt. Guilt's like, Guilt's pretty self-involved, actually. It's like, ooh, I did something, I'm, right? Vision is actually expansive. Vision is relational. Um, and so I think he, it was just a, he turned the fray. He just took a different approach, but I think it's the same idea. Boop. Oh, boy. I can't, I, 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 that didn't work too well. Let's see if I can. Okay, let's see if I can. My eyes are still somewhat good. So it says healing. The real issue is healing. Our motivation is to feel whole. Again, not doing good for them, but healing oneself. This is spiritually rooted in the intuition that we are deeply connected and that in healing ourselves, we work to heal the world as well. Thank you. So I, I'm, here I had another exercise, which we were not gonna do because it, be, it was gonna be this meditation from Wendell Berry, but, I, but this is what I have to say. Um, that it's a little confusing because most white folks don't think of yourselves as being hurt by racism. And that this piece I was gonna read by Ben Berry talks about how he finally realized how he had been wounded by racism and that it was the mirror image of the wound that African Americans carry. And different, but nonetheless there and very deep and he realized to be whole, he had to go into this place that he had avoided most of his adult life. Um, it makes you feel fearful and keeps you unconscious because you don't want to go there. What is, how does it do? It keeps you out of relationships you might have built, that, relationships that might have enriched your life because you were fearful and wounded. Um, it, it lets you build lives and you sense stuff on f false assumptions. This is what it does, okay? It lets you build your lives on self false assumptions. Um, so, it, and the nice thing about it is you can do this work anytime because it's your wounds. It's, it's, it's you beginning to mine your experience and actually look a little harder and gathering sort of more information and 
and, and actually realizing that everyone's wounded by racism, not just black folks. And as you do this work, what does it say? You're going to fall on your face. Can't help it. I mean, you, you know, if it, you were a child learning to walk, you'd expect to fall on your face. They don't learn how to walk without falling on their faces. So in this work, work mistakes are inevitable. So enjoy making them. I mean, why the hell? If you're going to do them, so might as well enjoy making them. See them as the learning opportunities that they are. It's the only way to learn. I mean, has anyone else learned how to do anything except making a mistake and then making another mistake and another mistake? Certainly, if you write. I mean, if I, I edit and edit, 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 edit. But I think everything is like that. Whatever you're doing, I mean, play, wait, basketball, tennis, ski. I mean, what do you do? Learn a language? I mean, what, what is it you do where you don't make mistakes? You tell me, I, and, lear, and learned anything. I don't think it's not possible. And so we're supposed to deal with racism, with all this other stuff behind it, and learn how to be comfortable in crossing borders in a multicultural world and not make mistakes? I don't think so. I don't think so. So you just get, you might as well, since you know you're going to make them, what's to be scared of? What's the option? Retreat. Retreat again. Well, that's pretty boring, actually. We, we live in our little boxes then, and it's kind of comfortable. Well, it's kind of dead, frankly. Um, so fall on your face. And since you know, you, is that okay? it's hard for Actually, it's real hard for us, I think, because we don't, we don't have a God there to catch us. We don't have a God there to catch us. I think it's different for some other folks. Your approach. Be led by your heart and a desire for connection rather than ideology. You know about, I'm going to come back. I'm going to see what I got next. Okay, no, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to do. So you know about ideology. Trouble with ideology is what, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? It, there's, where's the idea? It's, it's out there, and that's what we're trying to aspire to. But does it have anything to do with our relationship? Is it what we come up with together? No, it it's, 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 doesn't have anything to do with our relationship, and you're either right or wrong. You're either inside the ideological box or you're not. So I was just talking about yesterday. We, we choose right, right belief over right, right relationship. So at the close of the UUA board meeting in Selma, Don Harrington read these words from Howard Zen, the SNCC, right, uh, the new abolitionist. Um, it was a history of uh, the founding of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Why don't you all read it together? Finally, it all boils down to human relationships. It is a question of whether I shall go on living in isolation or whether there shall be a we. Love alone is radical. Political statements are not. Programs are not. Even going to jail is not. Love alone is radical. Boy, this, does he hear these echoes? Who was talking about we today? Barbara was talking about we, wasn't he? Wasn't he? And so was, and who's talking, I was talking about, and uh, what's C.T. Vivian? Uh, was Obama talking about we? Okay, I mean, you hear these echoes? This, you know, it's, this is not accidental, because this is the truth. This is the truth. Build relationships. That's, that's, I mean, that's what I've said yesterday. I spent 40 minutes doing. But it's about building relationships to, to one another is what will take us forward as opposed to, and yeah, as opposed to embracing an ideology or doing good. Uh, Robert Latham, another colleague. We, why don't you read it? Again, we keep you guys working here. We can cherish all our individual diversities as we like, but it will be those essentials we share in common that will empower us to transform the world as we wish it to become. So the diversities actually make our lives rich, you know, individually, um, different groups. I mean, kids, you know, like different, we all like different things, but it's the things we work out together. It's back to the we, right? It's back to the the things we have in common and the things we do together that will transform the world. Again, these just echoes, you, you hear this over and over and over. If you leave nothing else, those are the themes that you're gonna carry with you. Oh boy, that green was a mistake. Be hopeful. 
Knowing that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, work in complete confidence rather than earnestness. earnestness. Okay, so that's the advantage of that. I mean, in, 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 if we were in the Christian tradition, what we'd say, it was, Jesus, you know, we had to get to the end of the service. You say it's Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. But we know the arc of the universe bends towards justice. So why be earnest about it? We, we know where it's headed over the long span. Are you with? I mean, I mean don't have to want to say forget your lifespans. It's too small. You know, if you're lucky, you might, I mean, it's a miracle for some folks that Obama was elected. But off, that's too short a life. You need to give up, I mean, this is kind of Buddhist thing, but you gotta give up your ego stuff and being attached to here and now and look at things in big sweeps. There's no way from Jamestown in, in James, you know, Jamestown 1619 to get here. When the first you know, Engl English settlers were there and the Africans came in and the Native Americans were there, there's no way to get from 1619 to this day. You can't, you can't foresee, but the arc, the, the arc is gone. You can't get from 1965 to, to 2015 and imagine how this has changed. I walk around, I remember when I was a kid, I was gone flying down here. First time, and I, I, you know, I have to admit, I had a privileged upbringing. First time I was on a plane, was, I was probably 10 or 11, so it was probably 1959, and we flew Viscount. That's what they had back then, um, to DC. That's where my dad's parents were. And then we took a, um, and we took a boat to Europe um, in 62. Well, then I gagged, there were no black folks. I mean, dad and dad was worth it. He said there was he was there were no black folks in those places he went, and he did. They just weren't exist. You can't go into an airport now. You just can't. Well, there black folks every place. The pilot, you know, she, it's it's a she or it's an African. I mean, you can't. You if we get so caught up, but if I just look in my lifespan of sixty years, it's almost unrecognizable and almost. Unimaginable. I remember going. You go to Chicago, you know, no Hare Field, and, and you go to the airport, and every time you saw a black person, you nod. You you nod because you know you're only gonna see a couple of us at most, right? Hey, now you go. You going like this all the time, you know? And they think you're effing crazy, right? I mean, who are you? So, it's, and we get. I mean, it's not. I say the day is good, but it's not yesterday. And with that doesn't help to get keep that confused either. To pretend that it's like it, you know, like it is now, like it was, because it wasn't, and it's never going back. Oh, okay, we're going to end up, so I'm more or less on time. Ooh, God, that, that, so, so, that, that my my Canadian wife trained me um, to be on time. So let's going to say this together. You know, Joe Joe Cherry here's our minister in uh, Cleveland and Cleveland Society. So, I should say, so, well, I'll talk a little bit about Joe, just a, just a moment, just so you know. So, Joe is a Polish father and a Hispanic mother, and he's the only person in his family that looks white. Now, you carry that. It's not easy. It's not easy. And then, so, Joe has to listen to people say terrible shit about Hispanics because they don't know what he is when they look at him. I mean, that's, that's, that's that unconscious stuff, and it's quite pervasive. Um, so, so, but you get to work on it. So have, I'm gonna say have fun with it, and get to notice and cry about it, and laugh about it, and make your mistakes, and all these other things. Because there's no other way to do it, right? Just kind of wade into it, and things. It's gonna change anyhow, gang. Um, so you just might as well I want to say play in it, but I just give it the I, I, earnestness doesn't keep me. I don't want to talk about earnestness. I'll get carried away. So, I mean, what happens when you do something with, and you're earnest about it? How do you do it? <sighs> you know, you're tight. You're serious. You know, this is, I mean, it's not, it, I, I just, it's not the way. That's why music is so great. I mean, because... You know, music lifts you up, I mean, it can make you cry, but it enters into you in a whole different way. It doesn't have this earnest quality to it. So I, I just don't go away earnest either. <laughs> you know, and I, I know some folks get mad at me, you know, it's serious business, you know, people are dying. Yeah, that's true, but uh, being earnest is not gonna help them. 
Okay, let's do this together. If we have any hope of transforming the world and changing ourselves, we must be bold enough to step into our discomfort, brave enough to be clumsy there, loving enough to forgive ourselves and others. May we, as a people of faith, be granted the strength to be so bold, so brave, and so loving. Blessed be. Thank you for coming. Thank you.